Hello and welcome to this demonstration of Cloud Native Runtimes 1.0. My name is Miles and over the next couple of minutes I'm going to take you through what you can build on top of Cloud Native Runtimes 1.0 that was released recently. So Cloud Native Runtimes is part of the Tanzu Advanced suite of products from VMware and it packages up a number of things. So it includes Knative Eventing, Knative Serving and Trigger Mesh's AWS Event Sources uh, in case you're not aware of what that is. Uh, there's a public repository on the Trigger Mesh uh, sources for Amazon Web Services here. And it basically covers uh, a gamut of AWS ser uh, services that can be used as event sources to trigger Knative based workloads. So, what we've built here is an application that does number plate recognition uh, using machine learning, but it does that uh, by scaling out workloads based on demand using Knative. So what we're going to do is take a, a brief look at the components that make up this application and then contrast those to what Cloud Native Runtimes itself is bringing to the table. So if we have a look at the repository here, this is a publicly accessible repository. So if you want to run this yourself, you can. The instructions are all in the repo. It, it details how it was built, how it's put together, the architecture, and how you can deploy it yourself. Uh, but basically, in, in a nutshell, this is the application. So we've got our S3 event source over here that is provided by Trigger Mesh. So anytime we upload an image to S3, it will create a trigger. That will trigger an on-premises workload, uh, the first one being transformation. And this essentially downloads the image from S3, converts it into Base64, and sends it to our TensorFlow server, which is where our, our machine learning model lives. It does its AI ML based inferencing on it. It sends us back the results, which are just a big bunch of, of mathematical matrices. And then we send that on to our label analyzer application, which then takes those matrices and converts them into something human readable. So what we're actually aiming to extract here is the number plate from the image itself, put that into a Google sheet along with the time that it was seen and the reference to the image itself so that we can go back and make sure that it was actually accurate. Now, those are the parts that make up the application itself. As to what Cloud Native Runtimes and Knative are actually uh, offering here, all this communication between these applications, so the one, two, three, and four that you're seeing here is done via Knative eventing. These applications do not directly talk to each other. They simply create an output, send it to a bus, and then we have filters on the bus that activate other workloads. So for example, whenever the TensorFlow server generates its mathematical matrices, the output of the model, it puts it back onto the bus and the label analyzer is filtering and looking for those outputs so that whenever one appears, it will get spun up, it'll do its work, and then it'll get spun back down again. So that's the eventing portion. The Knative serving portion is what allows this to work elastically. Now you can do this with Kubernetes natively using stuff like horizontal pod autoscaler, but there are a number of drawbacks to that. First of all, when you're building something from an application perspective, Kubernetes is quite low level, like not super infrastructure low level, but the primitives you have to put together to get a URL to test out your application are not straightforward, right? There's a steep learning curve to Kubernetes and Knative aims to bring that down. It reduces stuff like load balancers, pods, replica sets, deployments, all that stuff that goes into making an application servable on Kubernetes into a single type called a service. You simply define your application, the image for it, how it's gonna run, how it's gonna scale. You deploy that and Knative transforms that into native Kubernetes objects. It also takes care of all the auto scaling stuff and you can use different metrics for that. But in addition, and this is something that is distinct from Kubernetes vanilla, is that it allows it to scale down to zero. So in the case of our machine learning app here, you can imagine if this is running on a GPU, GPUs are quite expensive. The way you would want to schedule that is that it only consumes that resource as long as it needs it. Whenever it's not, it scales down to zero and releases the resource for other applications to use them, thereby creating a better efficiency and a better consolidation of your resources in your clusters. There are a number of considerations around that as well, and it's not 
compulsory to scale down to zero. As an example, you can scale to one if you want. Say your application, for example, this TensorFlow server might have a long warm start to actually get the model up and running. Might take you know, 10, 13, 14, 15 seconds. And for your API to be responsive, you don't want that to be the case. So you can override that behavior if you want as well. It just depends on the application and what you're trying to achieve. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and actually run this application so you can see how it works. And then we'll dive into the manifest and show you how it was put together. So I'm gonna go into S3 here. So this is my bucket that we're targeting. We'll look at this in the manifest in a bit. And we go to upload, we're gonna add the files. And I've got a hundred images here and all of them do have a number plate in them somewhere. So we're gonna push these into the S3 bucket. Anytime there is an S3 object created in this bucket, the AWS event source from Trigger Mesh will create an event for us and trigger our on-premises workload to start spinning up and start doing its inferencing. So I'm gonna click upload here and you can see that's kicked off now. We've successfully uploaded two, three so far. So about one a second or so. We're gonna jump into Sockeye really quickly here so that we can just view the events that are coming into this cluster. So you can see up here, here's a historical graph of the number of events that are coming in. And as an example here, you can see that this one is of type com amazon.s3.object created. So there is an object created in the S3 bucket that we're looking for. Here's the name of that S3 bucket. And additionally, we also get information around what that file is called, and we can retrieve that from S3 itself. So if we scroll down here, you'll see that for each one of these images that was uploaded. Now we're gonna jump over to Visual Studio Code and take a look at how this is actually scaling on the cluster. So I'm gonna open up my terminal here, and we're gonna do a watch on the namespace that this is deployed into. And hopefully what we should see is a bunch of transformation pods and we can, and a bunch of inference server pods. And you'll notice that these are currently scaling out. So at the minute we've got, what is this? About nine transformation pods and about six inference servers. As it's uploading those images in the background, the more of those that are uploaded, the more events it will create. And we've set scaling limits on transformation and TF inference server to make sure that we are achieving a target latency per request. So that means that if we're not achieving that, it's going to continually scale out this application. So you can see that it's scaling out the transformation portion and the TF inference server. You'll also notice that we've got this label analyzer here. And label analyzer, like I said earlier on, takes the output of the ML model, which is again, just a bunch of mathematical matrices and translates them into something that's meaningful to a human being. That is the actual number plate itself, a URL to the image and the time that it was seen at. So you can see that these are all up and running now and scaling along nicely. Uh, and because the label analyzer is up, that means we've already got some results. So if we check in our Google sheet here, what we should see is a bunch of number plates already populated in, in that Google sheet. And as we watch it, you'll see more and more get added. So here we are in our Google sheet. You can see that we've got 33 inferences done so far. They're not necessarily in order. You know, this is an event-based system, so it's not guaranteed to be sequential, which is fine. You know, these are executing asymmetrically in parallel to each other. So there will be ones that come in later on that are from an earlier batch or what have you. But as you could see, as I was talking there, there are more images getting added. Likewise, if we just take one of these as an example, the model guessed that this one is S-U-A-F-G-S-E. And if we have a look at that image itself, S-U-A-F-G-S-E. So it has correctly noticed what that image is. You'll notice that this is not on a car. These are randomly generated images that are put onto different backgrounds to train the model. So it's not important that it's not on a car, but it can recognize number plates and infer those correctly. So if we wanna talk about a use case for something like this, obviously I put into a Google Sheet you know, that's just an example. It's a demonstration. This is not the end game for what this would really be used for. So the way that you could use an application like this, for example, is on a toll road. So you have peak hours of traffic, and then there are low hours during the day when everyone's in work where there's no traffic, okay? So what we have here is a system that's able to take a lot of concurrent requests scale out based on the concurrency and then scale back in again when it's not being used. That means those resources can be used for other applications. So instead of having GPUs attached to nodes or you know 
consuming CPU cycles for no reason, you can scale these things down automatically. And in the event, whenever you do have those rush hour periods, it'll scale right back up again to achieve your specific latency or whatever your, your target is for your API. And then again, scale back down again to zero or one if you want to look at warm start information. So while we're doing this, we're just going to have a look at Sockeye once again to show you that it's showing us more events. So if I refresh Sockeye here, uh, this will show us what live events are coming into the cluster. So it's uh, every time you refresh the page, it will pull in only the new events. So it's not, it doesn't, doesn't give you a historical view of things. But what we should see here is a combination of events. We should see the model output, which like I said, is this big mathematical matrix here. And then if we scroll all the way down, and this is really, really long, uh, if we scroll all the way down, what we should see uh, after it's inferred those is an output from our label analyzer that says, here is the, the actual ID of that number plate. So if we go into our S3 management console, you can see all those files have been uploaded. It's still uploading some of the images to uh, the, the service doing its inferencing and putting those into the, the Google Sheet. But if we jump back over into our application here, what you'll see is that a number of these are now in terminating state. That's because they're not actively being used anymore. By default with Knative and CNR, the spin down timer is 60 seconds. You can change that to be whatever you want. For example, for the inference server, we've changed that to be 180 seconds just so that we get a better response on the API. So it's not unnecessarily spinning down and spinning up something that's got a long startup time. So you can see that it's cleaning up after itself quite nicely here. Because the transformation containers are not really being used anymore, we've only got two that are active. It's terminating the rest. And likewise, it will do the same with the inference server. I'll just leave it on this page here until it runs and spins back down again so you can see it completely cleans up after itself. We've successfully scaled to zero on both of those applications. So as we can see, the application is completely scaled back down to zero again. So if we just minimize this, because we don't need it anymore, uh, I'm going to take you briefly through the manifest on how all these bits fit together. So this is the manifest that's in the repository. There's a couple of bits of information if you wanted to run this yourself that you would have to fill in. Basically, just look for the double uh, quotes anywhere. Anywhere you see double quotes, you change that out to be your own value. So you can see, first of all, we've got a AWS secret. So that's the access key and secret to pull the images from our S3 bucket. The next one is our Google credentials JSON file. This is created in the GCP console, and this is what gives the application access to the Google Sheet in order to update it. And the magic piece that pulls the events from S3 and lets us trigger our on-premises workloads is this AWS S3 source from TriggerMesh. And this is bundled as part of CNR 1.0 as well. So you can see here that it takes the AWS key and uh, secret from the credential earlier on, and it's looking for any events of type S3 object created in the bucket that you define here. So this will be your Amazon resource uh, name here, the ARN. Uh, for your particular bucket and region, you put that in here. Anytime there is an object created inside that bucket, it will automatically create an event. Knative eventing will then tick that, put it onto the bus, and then it'll allow the workloads to be triggered from there. Like I said, um, Knative greatly simplifies deploying applications on top of Kubernetes for app developers. So you can set up your application like so as a type of service under serving.knative.dev slash v1. You can see as an example here, we've got our transformation service. We set our scaling target to four. So once there are four concurrent requests to this service, it'll scale out and create another one. And it will evaluate that over a 60 second rolling average period. You can see that we specify the container that's being used. And then we put a couple of environment variables in here. So this is just pod speckable. So anything that you use in the pod spec in a standard Kubernetes object can be used here. We're passing in our Kubernetes sync, which is our uh, broker that we use to put stuff onto the bus. Uh, we pass in our AWS region and our TensorFlow model endpoint. So you can see here's an example of that. 
the actual bit that does the work, the triggering of those Knative serving workloads is Knative eventing. Knative eventing has this type of trigger. And you can see here that it's pulling off of the bus called broker default. We are then filtering for a type of an object, which is com.amazon.s3.objectcreated. So anytime there's an object created event, it will trigger this transformation service. So you can see that we set our, our bus, we create a filter of what events to look for, and then we create our target for those events. So in this, in this case, anytime there's an S3 object created, it will spin up an instance or send that, rather send that event to the transformation service that we defined above. And that pattern just repeats itself down this uh, manifest file for the entire application. So we've got service, a trigger, a service, a trigger, a service, a trigger, the whole way down, uh, just with different images and different targets, as well as some different environment variables, but largely the same kind of pattern seen the whole way through. So I hope that gives you a quick overview of what you can build with Cloud Native Runtimes 1.0, particularly the Knative serving component, as well as the Knative eventing and trigger mesh integrations, which are in beta in 1.0. For more information on Cloud Native Runtimes, check out tanzu.vmware.com or the links to the documentation in the description. Thanks for watching.